Would you stand with me now for the reading of God's Word from Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the uh, word. And as we delve into it uh, a bit this morning, we pray that you will, uh, Lord, enlighten our minds and then give us hearts that truly seek after you, diligently seek after you. You promise that those who diligently seek you will find you. And that's what we desire for ourselves and for others. We pray that um, this word will become alive. We pray for those among us right now. There are so many who seem to be sick or suffering or, Lord, just facing some very serious situations, many, many, uh, far more than the norm. And so we want to lift them all up to you this morning, praying that you will be gracious in their lives, provide the healing of whatever nature is needed, whether it be physical, emotional, spiritual. Bring about, Lord, the miracles that are everyday miracles that we take so for granted but need so often, and I pray for that. Pray for our missionaries near and far, as Trevor has already prayed. Lord, we just lift them up. Pray for Teresa as she goes through her language study now. Pray that you will not only help her mind to work quickly and efficiently, but give her grace Help her. She undoubtedly would face feelings of homesickness and being far away from her culture and everything she needs. So grateful that we could be part of the courage and the ministry of a young woman like this. And we pray that you will send out many from our own church with the same spirit of commitment to you and to taking the gospel to the far hard places of the, of the world. Lord, now we pray that this time will be yours to speak to us. We put aside the distractions. We renounce the things that fill our minds and take us away from what you want to say. And we open ourselves to you in the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. may be seated. Turn with us, if you've not already, to uh, Luke chapter 20. As I look out, I think some of you are probably, not not everybody, but some of you are old enough to remember Wiley B., Wiley Coyote, remember him? Um, The guy that was always trying to destroy the Roadrunner in these Warner Brothers cartoons, right? Uh, By using different methods that he got from the Acme uh, mail order place, all these contraptions, you know, rocket-powered... Sled, jet-powered skis, you know, earthquake, earthquake pills, you name it, he was trying it. Of course, it always rebounded against him. He always fails. He always ends up squashed flat, knocked senseless, burned to a crisp, never quite got the job done. I'm sure you all remember that fondly. But, you know, if you put the Pharisees of Jesus' time in the place of Wiley Coyote you kind of have a view of what this last week in Jesus' life was like, right up to the moment when he finally let them take him and kill him. But until then, every encounter, they came at him in waves this last week as he was teaching in the temple, and they all went away burnt to a crisp, the best and the brightest, because of the superiority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their own devices were used against him. It's an incredible display that goes on there. Now, the the passage that we've just read is usually taught as teaching about Christians and government, and it does touch on that, and next week we will talk about that just a little bit, but that's a sidelight. 
The main point of this passage is to show the superiority of divine wisdom over human wisdom. That's the main point. That's what Luke has put it here for. God's wisdom, God's revelation will always be superior to human wisdom, however it may look. And every time the enemies come against Jesus, he turns the whole thing around against them because human wisdom, as attractive as it can look, and it does, and many people spend their whole lives devoted to it. And many of us have bought into it far more than we realize, but it will never be a match for divine wisdom. It will never be a match for the divine revelation of God. So this text is powerfully demonstrating human wisdom versus divine wisdom. So I want to look today at the characteristics of human wisdom that we find here. Next week at the characteristics of divine wisdom. I want us to be able to see Is it possible that we've been misled, that we're going down this road of human wisdom, even as a Christian? This is mainly aimed at those who are unbelievers, but even as a Christian, we can be taken in, and we need to be able to recognize that we're going down a road that can only lead in the end to destruction. So what are the characteristics of human wisdom that we find in this passage? Well, the first one is that it disregards sin. Human wisdom disregards sin. I think one of the first things we have to realize as we come to this passage is that Jesus' enemies thought they were right, right? They thought they were defending God's honor. This was what was in the back of their mind. They believed Jesus was a blasphemer. At the end of the day, they were absolute fools for not looking more closely, not only at the things that he did and the life that he lived, but at the prophecies that he was fulfilling. I mean, the evidence was everywhere that this was the Son of God, that this was the Messiah, and yet they totally turned away from all of that. But they thought they had it right. They thought they had it right. The reason they thought they had it right, according to the Bible, is that they were spiritually blind. They were spiritually blind. They could see perfectly well physically, but spiritually, they were blind. They were perfect embodiment of what Paul describes later in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, where he says this. He says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They were absolutely blind to the truth. But we also have to realize that didn't take them off the hook. They didn't get a pass because they were spiritually blind. They're not going to be able to stand before God one day and say, well, you listen, Satan blinded my eyes. It's not my fault. Because they were culpable. They refused the cure. The cure starts with acknowledging that you're blind. That's where you have to start. Well, how do you know that you're blind? Here's one of the best ways. You disregard sin. You downplay sin. You find a church where they don't talk about sin. You hate it when the pastor talks about sin. You cringe. At the word, that's the first sign, beloved, of spiritual blindness. It disregards sin. It passes it over. Spiritually blind people will do anything else with sin other than what we should do with it. They will repress it. They'll deny it. They'll downplay it. They'll minimize it. They'll excuse it. They'll spin it. They'll rationalize it. They'll do everything except what needs to be done with it, which is to repent of it. Sin is a reality. Guilt is a reality because sin is a reality. The whole mess that we see in the world is what? It's all a result of sin, and yet we deny sin, pretend like it doesn't exist. But a low view of sin is a sure sign of spiritual blindness. If you bristle when you hear somebody start to talk about it, beloved, be careful. It's the first sign that you're not seeing spiritually, not seeing spiritual things, not understanding what God is trying to say. Now notice the context of this encounter. Verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived 
that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So these guys, they hate Jesus, and they want to do away with him now. Why is that? Well, they've had a lot of reason up till now, but right now they've recognized the parable that he just spoke was against them. What parable was that? That was the parable of the tenants who begin to act like owners in the absence of the owner. And they recognized that Jesus was pointing straight at them and was basically saying, you guys want to run your own life. You're trying to rule your own existence when God, just because he's absent and he isn't here, you thought you could reinterpret his law. You thought you could redo his scripture. You thought you could take his wisdom and make it whatever you wanted to. And they knew that he was pointing at them. Jesus was doing with that parable what he's always doing with every parable and with every sermon and with every message. He's pointing out the sin and he's eliciting, soliciting repentance. And they are not about to go there. Instead, it stirs up hatred in the hearts of those who don't want to go there. It's good to repent, beloved, but it's hard. God followers live a lifestyle of repentance. Unbelievers take offense at the very mention of the word. You know, this year we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, which is usually said to have begun when Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the, on the chapel door in Wittenberg. But guess what the topic of those 95 theses were? What do you think? Justification by faith? <clears throat> Railing against the indulgences that were being sold by the church at that point in time? Yeah, well, they're all there. But you know what the first thing on, on Luther's mind was and the thing that filters all the way through those 95 theses was? It was repentance. Listen to the first one. He says, When our Lord and Master said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He meant that the whole life of believers should be repentance. Repentance doesn't start and end the moment we come to faith in Christ. We're as saved as we can be at that point in time, that's true. But repentance is the ongoing response of a true child of God to the loving nature of his Holy Father when you recognize that you have once again violated his holy character. And so repentance is an ongoing thing. Christian people aren't just repentant people. They are repenting people. And if your heart rebels against that, there can only be one answer to that, and that is that there is spiritual blindness going on. You are almost certainly on the outside looking in. That's why the Pharisees were having such a problem with this. They couldn't stand the implication. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him, which is a euphemism for kill. You can, you can trace that phraseology through the New Testament, and it means to kill. They wanted to kill him at that very hour. It wasn't repentance that was in their heart. It was murder that was in their heart. That was their response to his message. That was their response to his call for repentance. They wanted to kill the one and only perfect, sinless person who ever walked the face of the earth. You talk about spiritually blind. You can't get much blinder than that, can you? And their sin is shown by their methods. I mean, Luke kind of makes a point of that, right? They spied, they misrepresented, they flattered, they lied, they presented themselves as something that they really weren't. They were hypocrites through and through, as Jesus made very clear in a sermon later that week in Matthew 23 that's recorded. They were in complete denial because human wisdom glosses over sin. Human wisdom glosses over sin. A little naughtiness can spice up your life. I mean, we have a million ways that we do that, right? We laugh at it. We think it's funny. That's human wisdom. Human wisdom glosses over sin. That's because it hates accountability. But listen, what if God is real? What if sin is real? What if guilt is real? 
I, one of the, when I was in business, one of the customers we had was the Indiana State Police. So I spent a lot of time in Indianapolis. I was there one day and the colonel in the state police said to me, have you ever been to the brickyard? I said, no, I've never been there. I've watched it on TV, but I've never been there. He said, well, let's go. So he took me over and he got, a, got me a tour of the Indianapolis 500 Speedway, including all the way through the museum. But you know what the thing that was most noticeable at that, at, that, at that museum was? It was what was missing. It wasn't so much what was there. All the cars and, you know, the stories of all the guys that had won at, at Indianapolis was wonderful. But you know what was missing? There was not one word about the 40-plus guys who have died on that racetrack. Not one. They weren't mentioned on a, on a plaque. They weren't mentioned in any of the write-ups. There was no mention whatsoever to honor their memory. I found out they have never declared somebody dead on that racetrack, although several have died on that racetrack. Scott Goodyear, one of the old-time racers, he once said this. He explained it this way. He said, you don't look at where it happened. You don't <laughs> notice the word it. You don't look at where it happened. You don't watch the films of it on television. You don't deal with it. You pretend it never happened. That's denial. And that's how human wisdom treats sin, as though it didn't exist. God's well aware of that. He makes the statement in Romans 1.18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They know the truth, but they suppress it. There are no real atheists. The Bible's position is everybody knows there's a God. They choose to suppress it. They choose to not believe it. Human wisdom deals with guilt by suppression rather than by confession, which is the only way it can really be dealt with. Psychology teaches us to ignore, deny, rationalize, you know, just kind of get it out, keep talking about it until all of a sudden it doesn't bother you, but it can only be remedied by repentance. That's why, by the way, you know, when you read about the Hollywood stars and the other celebrities who are in, you know, under psychological treatment for years, the reason is really simple. The only way you can get rid of guilt is by repentance. No other way will do it. That's why you go for years and years and years and years and you can't get over it because the guilt is real. Human wisdom does not know how to deal with it. But when you deny the reality of sin and you will not repent of your sin, you are headed right into the storm of God's eternal wrath against those things that violate his holy case. It's not just a matter of, you know, messing around with a list of do's and don'ts. You know, do go to class, do wash your hands after you go to the bathroom, whatever. That's not what the Ten Commandments, you know what the, the, the Ten Commandments, the moral law is an expression of God's character. So you're not just failing to keep a law, you are violating the person of God. Human wisdom will never acknowledge that. But it's true. All right, so human wisdom downplays sin. Secondly, human, human wisdom deifies man, deifies man. In other words, it makes a God out of man. Now, it does this in a lot of ways. Some people just come right out and say man is his own God. There is no God, and therefore man is it. But there, there are far more people who actually clothe their deification of man in religious garb. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They were talking about God. They were paying lip service to God. But by their actions, they were deifying themselves. And they were deifying man. They were choosing man's wisdom over God's wisdom. Do you see? That's why, they were, that's why they were remaking the law in their own image. That's why they were rewriting God's law. God's law wasn't good enough. They rewrote it for him. Thank you very much. God thought his law was okay beforehand. 
They deified themselves. Now, you, you can see it in the partnership here, for one thing. The scribes and the chief priests, it says, came at Jesus on this occasion. They were on the attack. Who are the scribes? Remember, the scribes are the highly educated Pharisees. The priests are, are the Sadducees. And Matthew uh, 22 and Mark 12 tell us that to these groups, the Sadducees, the, the priests, who were the, who were the Sadducees and the Pharisees who were the scribes, in addition to them, the Herodians were also in this group that was coming at Jesus at this point in time. And here's what you have to understand. Those groups hated each other. Worse than Republicans and Democrats. They hated each other. They couldn't get along about anything. The Pharisees were those who were nationalistic. The Pharisees were the ones who wanted to see Messiah ride into town on a white horse and kick the Romans out, and that's what they lived and breathed for. They hated being under the thumb of the Romans, and so they were doing anything and everything they could to get out from under that. The Sadducees and the Herodians, on the other hand, they'd caved in already. They'd sold out. They were like the Vichy government in France during World War II that, you know, accommodated the Nazis. Come on in. That was the Herodians and the Sadducees. And so these two groups were absolutely hated each other. The Pharisees would rather switch than fight. The Herodians and the, and the, and the uh, priests would rather, fight th uh, would rather switch than fight. I said that backwards. The Pharisees would rather fight than switch. You know what I meant, right? Okay. <laughs> They hated each other. They couldn't agree on anything except one thing. They agreed that they hated Jesus. They hated Jesus. They wanted him killed. They thought that what they were and who they were was better than Jesus. And they would have killed him right then and there except they feared the crowd. They knew the crowd would be after them because the crowd was still a day or two from turning against Jesus themselves. So what Luke is showing us here is Really simple. He's showing us that while human wisdom may come in many flavors, it may be the priests, it may be the Sadducees, it may be the Buddhists, it may be the Shintos, it may, they can come in many flavors. It unites in its desire to deify man and to bring God down. What we have here is the same thing we have in Genesis 11 where they were building a tower to reach to God. This is man saying, I can get there on my own. The deification of man. Here are the scribes, and here are the chief priests face to face with God in the flesh, and they would rather take their opinion over his revelation. Think about it. Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ was the ultimate and final revelation of God. They will never get a better picture of God than the one they're looking at right now, and they're turning it down. They're, putting, they're pitting themselves against them. They've come with their little pity question that they're going to offer that they think is going to absolutely snowball him. Human wisdom against divine wisdom. What fools! They didn't look at it that way. They're elevating God, uh, elevating themselves above God. You know what? It's Eden all over again, right? It's Genesis 3 all over again when Satan came to Adam and Eve and he tempted them by saying what? You will be like God. Be your own God. You don't need God. You can be like God. Be your own God. It's the foundation of every Christless religion and philosophy known to mankind. It's the inevitable result of, of pitting human wisdom against divine revelation. It doesn't matter the flavor. It doesn't matter the flavor. It doesn't matter whether it purports to be religious or whether it purports to be irreligious. It doesn't matter whether it's Islam or Mohammedanism or Taoism or Confucianism or naturalism or secularism or atheism. It doesn't matter what ism it is. It's elevating man and deifying man against God. It's saying what we know is better than what he's revealed. The deification of man. You can be your own God. It's the longest running play in history, right? You can be your own God. It's always been there. With the scientific discoveries of the Enlightenment age, 
you know, really, it, it began to be just flat out stated when we get to that point. I, I don't think anyone has ever stated it stronger than Anne Rand. She said this. This is a blunt statement. Listen to this. But this is, this, is, this is the deification of man. She said, reason is man's only source of knowledge and his basic tool of survival. Man is an end in himself, which means that each individual must live, live by his own mind and for his own sake. There it is. It's Genesis 3 all over again, right? It's the Tower of Babel all over again. It's Nebuchadnezzar standing on his balcony and saying, is this not great Babylon that I have built all over again? It's Carl Sagan in our day saying the universe is all that ever, you know, what a, what a dramatic, you know, foolish statement as though he knew everything, absurd certainty to his statement, the universe is all that ever was, is, or ever will be. Since when did you get all knowledge? It's Robert Ingersoll, the great, you know, agnostic of the 19th century, saying, if there is a God, let him strike me down in one minute. And then he counted off one minute, and he was still standing. He says, see, there is no God, as though God's grace could be exhausted in one minute. The longest-running play in history, you can be your own God. Still playing. Still playing in our own lives occasionally, right? You can be your own God. You know better. God says this. You know better than that. God can't mean that. That was for them. It's as foolish now as it ever was, right? It didn't work in Eden. It didn't work in Babel. It didn't work in Babylon. It didn't work in first century Palestine, and it won't work in 21st century America either. God's reaction is what you would expect of one who is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Think about who God is. He is everywhere. He is all-powerful within the bounds of his own character, and he is all-knowing. And the Bible says when he sees human wisdom, you know what his reaction is? It's in Psalm 2, verse 4. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Don't get caught up in human wisdom. Beloved, when human wisdom is at odds with God's revelation, take God's revelation. If you fear the opinions of man more than God, you desire the approval of man more than God, please reconsider. Please reconsider. I don't know who got a hold of you when or where, what college professor, what person you worked with, what other person that was influential in your life, in your business career, whatever. But if it's human wisdom that's at odds with God's revelation, you must choose God's revelation. God's truth is the only truth that does not require constant revision. Have you ever noticed that? You know, if you think, this, if you think the, the scientific community has disproved God and disproved the Word of God, think about this. The science books are rewritten every 10 to 20 years, right? They are. They go out of style. The Word of God has never had to be rewritten. It's as true today as it was then. And I've, I've shared with you before, but it even, it, even, it even demonstrates much scientific truth hundreds of years before man ever discovered some of it, right? So it deifies man. What's the third thing that human wisdom does? It devalues Christ. It uh, depreciates or disregards sin. It deifies man. And it devalues Christ. Human wisdom always devalues Christ. You'll even hear, you'll even hear a lot of people who say they believe in God. They just don't believe in Jesus. You know, the minute you hear that, it's human wisdom. It's the same thing that's going on here. These men rejected the word of Jesus. And therefore, they rejected his authority, 
and his person. Remember, they're having this conversation. Why? Why are they having this conversation? They're having this conversation because they rejected the parable that he told to them that was specifically aimed at them. Now, if Jesus came and stood and told you a parable that related to you, would you be listening? But these men were not. They rejected him. They heard the word directly from him, and they flat out rejected it. They devalued Jesus. This led to their devaluing his authority. Rather than submit to his warning, they decided to kill him. And it always comes down to that, doesn't it? Jesus, Jesus lays the line in the sand. It's either submit to his lordship or join the crew that's crucifying him at the cross. It's one or the other. I mean, he's that important in history. He's that important in every single human life. But they have devalued his authority. Worse, they judged themselves to be more clever than he. <laughs> they thought they could ask him this clever question, you know, and they thought, okay, we've asked him this question. We got him now, just like the group that came just before them. We got him now. If he says, go ahead and pay the tax to Caesar, this crowd is going to turn against him in a flash, which they would have. On the other hand, if he says, no, you should, you should, you should, you don't need to pay the tax to Caesar, then Rome is going to be after him. Either way, they win, he loses. So that's their little question that they're going to catch him out on. Now, we're going to see next week that in 30 seconds, he turns it against them. <laughs> okay? But they thought they had him. They thought they were so clever. They were going to put themselves up against the Son of God. This is the pinnacle in that day of human wisdom. Now, I know we think we've advanced a long ways beyond that today. Our pinnacle is a lot higher than theirs. And it is, from the standpoint of how much we know. It's about like from here, here's the size of our human wisdom, and if you go you know, to the end of the universe, there you have God's wisdom. That's about how close we are. We've advanced from here to here against the whole universe. Get a handle on this, beloved. Understand that God's wisdom and God's revelation is always superior to the wisdom of of man. You know, this little verbal exchange that they're going to have could easily fit into the 21st century, couldn't it? We have people challenging the wisdom of God all the time. Human wisdom still thinks it can outwit God. Human wisdom still willingly and willfully devalues the Son of God. Human wisdom still pits itself against the person and the, and the priorities and the authority of Christ. We do it different ways. It's interesting to see how we do it. You know, some people are just out and out against Christ, but you know, most of the world is not. Most of the world has a certain amount of reverence for Christ. Most religions will accept Jesus as a great prophet, or as a prophet at least. But here's what they've done. Dorothy Sayers points this out. She says the people who killed Jesus never accused, they killed him, but they never accused him of being a bore like we do today. She says this, she says, on the contrary, they thought him too dynamic to be safe. It has been left for later generations to muffle up that shattering personality and surround him with an atmosphere of tedium. We have very efficiently paired the claws of the Lion of Judah, certified him, meek and mild, and recommended him as a fitting household pet for pale pastors and pious ladies. I could have done without the pale pastor part of that, but she got, you get the point, right? We've tamed him, or so we think. He, we, we've made a parody out of Jesus. We pull him out at funeral services, you know, to make ourselves feel good. When life comes crashing in, oh, whoa, got to get to church and pray. But the rest of our life, where is he? Nowhere to be found. And yet Jesus says, if you're my follower, you must deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. He doesn't say anything about in crisis periods only. We've kidded ourselves because human wisdom has devalued, devalued the Son of God. It always will. But here's the conclusion. Turn to Daniel 2 with me. The conclusion is 
the divine wisdom, divine revelation will always win. Divine wisdom will always win in the end. Daniel 2. First, let me read for you from, from 1 Corinthians 1, because Paul brings everything back to Christ when it comes to wisdom. Here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23. He says, but we preach Christ crucified. He said, I, we preach him even though we know he's a stumbling block to the Jews. It's a folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, not saved people, beloved, those who have been called by God, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And if you want to see that in living color, there's no better place than Daniel 2. In Daniel 2, God gave a vision to a pagan ruler named Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon well-known to secular history. Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of a great statue, and he didn't know what to make of it. Couldn't interpret it. Called in all of his, the guys that were supposed to tell him what these things meant, and they said, well, tell us the dream, and we'll tell you the interpretation. He said, oh, no, you tell me the dream, and then I'll know you probably got the interpretation right. They didn't think he was playing fair, but I think that's a pretty good strategy, don't you? Tell me the dream. He was about to kill them all because they didn't begin to know how to do it. And this young kid, Daniel, who's just come from Israel, gets wind of this. And he prays to God and he says, God, I'm going to put myself on, on a limb and I'm going to tell him that I know. I'll, I'll tell him the dream and I'll tell him the interpretation. And he, he had himself brought in before the king. And then he told the king what the dream was and then he told the king the interpretation. And it turned out what the dream was was a vision of, this, of the future of the whole world in this, in this image that, that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And he said, Nebuchadnezzar, that head of gold, that's you. That represents now. This is 600 B.C. But he said then the, the next part of that body, that's a Medo-Persian empire. Well, they'd heard a little bit about the Medes and Persians at that time, but not much. But in 538, they were going to take over. And here's God prophesying that in 600 B.C., and then he says, the next part, the legs, that's Greece. They're coming along in 333 B.C. And they're going to take over. And they're going to be followed by the feet and the toes, which is Rome. And he's prophesying this, beloved, hundreds of years in advance. And then he says, there will be a revived Roman Empire that's future even to us. But something's going to happen to that one. And so if you're in Daniel 2, look at, let's pick up at verse 44. It says, In the days of those kings, that is the end time rulers, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut out from the mountain by no human hand, that's a reference to Jesus, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. What he's saying is, in other words, at the end of all time, God wins. Human wisdom at its pinnacle is no match for God. So when it comes down, beloved, to a contest between what your human wisdom tells you to be right or what somebody else's human wisdom tells you to be right or what some politician tells you is right or what some judge tells you is right or what some professor in college tells you is right and it's in violation of the written, revealed will of God, you must go with the will of God. Peace and eternal life are on God's side. It's, where they, it's the only place they come from. It's like a bunch of kids that are playing baseball. And, uh, you know, an old guy wanders by and he notices this one team seems to be out in the field the whole time and the other one doesn't seem to be 
giving up its time at bat. And so he finally stops and he asks one of the boys, he says, hey, what's the score? And he says, 18 to nothing against us. He says, 18 to nothing? You, you, you should be discouraged. You don't look discouraged. The guy said, the kid said, discouraged? We haven't had our bats yet. We haven't been up yet. That's the way it is with God, beloved. He hasn't had his final at bats yet. The final score hasn't been written. When it is, human wisdom is in for a great fall. The wisdom of God will prevail. That's the side you want to be on. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reminder here of the limitations and the fallacies of human wisdom. Thank you that human wisdom can do much. Lord, we even have <clears throat> people right now seeking human wisdom in the medical solutions that have been discovered for some of the problems that in years past wouldn't have been able to be addressed. We're thankful for that. But when human wisdom pits itself against your wisdom, it can never succeed. So, Father, help us to place ourselves on the right side. Help us to defer, to understand and to defer the wisdom of God. Help our young people as they go away to college and as they will hear a lot that is merely human wisdom that is an antithesis to the truth of Scripture. Lord, bind their hearts now to a determination that they're committed to the truth that you've given us. And help all of us, Father, because we're also susceptible. We're all susceptible every day to the lies that are out there. Help us to be able to, to discern the truth from the lies and to go with the truth of the wisdom of God. How we wish the Pharisees had done that. How we hope that many of them were some of the ones that were saved a few weeks later when the death and resurrection of Jesus had happened and the preaching started and many came to faith in Christ. Pray that many of these who were there were among those. Help us to be faithful in getting the message out. Bless us now, Lord, as we close in singing this closing hymn together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.